We are here in the Epic Eights with the final quarterfinal match ahead of us. But for any of you who have just tuned in, welcome to Heroes of the Dorm. My name is Day9. I am joined by Grubby and Tim, AKA Trixler. We have been having an absolute blast covering these matches, but you might have just tuned in and have no idea what esports or Heroes of the Storm is. For an intro to the game, stay tuned for right now. Welcome to Heroes of the Storm, Blizzard Entertainment's action-packed Team Brawler. Players can choose from a variety of Blizzard heroes, each with unique strengths and weaknesses, to create five-player team compositions that support versatile strategies. These strategies are then put to the test on a diverse set of battlegrounds, each with their own unique objectives. Hire the Ghost Pirate Blackheart, summon a powerful Grave Golem, Every battleground is different and presents a unique environment for competition. However, the criteria for victory is constant. Destroy the opposing team's core. Heroes will grow in power and talent over the course of a single game as they take out minions, enemy fortifications, and of course, the opposing team's heroes. Your effectiveness at teamwork and collaborative play will make or break you. Indeed, managing the three tug of wars with your hero composition, trying to do all you can to push one down to finally kill the core, takes many, many forms as there are different hero mixes, there are different battlegrounds on which to play. And of course, my heart is still beating from the insane <laughs> match that we just saw. I mean, I, I still need to take another moment to just say that was an insane series of decisions from Washington that made for an action-packed game. Yeah, I mean, the average game length is like 19 minutes. It's very action-packed. This was over 30 minutes long, yeah. and none of it was dull. There was never more than one hero-level disparity. That Those games were so close. Such a pleasure yeah. to watch as a fan of the game, really. Yeah, I mean, truly being a caster is more like being a fan with the front row seat. We were all grabbing each other. I mean, the tension is paramount. And, of course, this very first map that we're going to be going in on, Tomb of the Spider Queen, has been intense throughout. Has provided some very different matches, some very varied experiences. And if you're just tuning in, of course, don't worry. We have you covered. Tim, walk us through how we arrived here today and what's been going on in the Epic Eight. Dana, I gotta agree with you. That last game was crazy. My heart's still beating as well. So you guys over there, drink some water, chill out. We'll come over a little bit. Let's get everyone else at home caught up. So we've had a total of three amazing matches so far today, and we're gonna find out who exactly is moving on to the Heroic Four next Saturday that will be, of course, delivered by ESPN. So in the top left corner, we had Boston College versus Western Ontario. Boston College was able to secure a nice win over them. In the bottom left corner, Arizona State versus Texas A&M. Arizona State is moving forward. And then we just witnessed the undefeated teams now undefeated, just move forward as Cal Berkeley was able to grab two wins, but an exciting match overall. We have one more team left for you at home to watch, and it's going to be Indiana versus Illinois. I'm excited. I'm pumped. It's the last game of the day. Let's all go into it. Day nine, Grubby. Let's do it. Thank you, Tim. I'm looking forward to seeing what the output will be between Indiana and Illinois. We've seen such a wide variety of different styles brought to the table. Of course, you'll probably hear us mention the last match once or twice, but for this one, Indiana going up against the University of Illinois. Now, in this particular match, the records, though very strong, they are not on the same level uh, in terms of consistency as the other teams. But that is the story of the previous matches. It's unclear how much they've practiced, what they're bringing to the table now, Let's begin by taking a look at Indiana. Right. I mean, uh, the, you know, the results of the past are never a guarantee for the future. It would be at your own risk to believe that going up against a team that has been blooded a little bit already. Here we've got the mighty Churros. Interestingly, all five players have known each other for over five years already. So the team synergy should probably definitely be there. Yeah, this is something that many pro teams even struggle with, the fact that you want your team to be the best it possibly can be. There's roster changes that happen frequently, but at its core, Heroes of the Storm is about team-wide communication. The fact that Indiana likely has a communication line that's been open for many years means that feedback loop, that trust in one another is going to be much stronger than an average team. Yeah, the chemistry should be very, very high with this team with that many years on your belt. A lot of the higher level teams actually only have about two to three months playing with each other, so that's a huge advantage. And it's gotten this far. 
can it move him to the Heroic Four? Here you see uh, the roster for our team's Wilted in uh, particular is one that stood out for me. He played very, very well last week. Um, we're going to see how he'll be playing tonight, but his support play is on par. And as we talked about before, again, the double assassin between Graves Robber and Faze. Very cool, very interesting to see being part of the mix. UC Berkeley relied heavily on that as well. Now let's go ahead and take a look at Illinois, the opponents of Indiana in this match. It's going to be the Mad Banners. Again, also a very assassin heavy hero role breakdown, but I especially love that Uther is one of the most picked heroes. Now, in stark contrast, this team had never played together prior to Heroes of the Dorm. <laughs> so if they were to win here, maybe it's down to a quick matchmaking that is very successful, or maybe their mechanical skill here that shines through. But that's a pretty big difference here, as at least their win rate yeah. is roughly similar. Yeah, I mean, it, it's interesting to see both the difference between what is the team composition's goal, but then how do the players translate that goal? Are they looking to be more cautious? Are they the sort to be a little more aggressive or have one of their players be a little more aggressive? Looking into it, they have double assassin as well. You can see here with Mr. Berkey's uh, really just going to be uh, showing his power when it comes to actual pure damage, of course, his teammate as well. And... Double Assassin is actually a pretty strong composition on the first battleground that we'll be going into. Tomb of the Spider Queen, we've seen it work a couple of times. Can they keep up with that method of using the damage to win teamfights yeah. very quickly? Let's hop in and take a look at Tomb of the Spider Queen, the map that has been played three times today already. This battleground in particular has a very tense amount of teamfights that begin happening real soon. Let's take a look. As always in Heroes of the Storm, the lanes, the defining feature, the triple tug of war that all teams are trying to manage throughout. But on this particular map, spaces are tight. It's very quick to rotate between the top to the mid to the bottom. The mercenary camps can apply additional pressure, but what's really important for the teams to do is to collect and turn in gems. They do this by killing enemy heroes, by killing the enemy minions that are within the lane. This will eventually summon the web weavers, the spiders that can push, that have massive health and can shove forward. The boss in the middle, the throw pit as you called it, Grubby, a high risk, high reward proposition. Who will be able to take the win? It's going to come down to team fights. All about the team fights in the mid and late game. I'm so excited to see again, what is these two teams take? Yeah. on the draft for this match. And there have been a number of heroes that were pioneered today, which were picked first. For, for instance, Asmodan. But there's also a lot of heroes we haven't seen yet. Uh, there are heroes available that haven't come into play. For instance, Kerrigan, Arthas, uh, Muradin. Probably we won't see them, but it's always possible that one of these teams has prepared a special strategy with yeah, them. Yeah, I'm partial to Sonya on this map because she has a decent amount of damage, can roam pretty well, and of course has the Ua, which is so fun to watch. But <laughs> looking into Indiana, we have Jaina picking up the first hero. We have Sylvanas following up for Illinois and Diablo. Now, uh, Sylvanas is a, a sensible choice. Of course, her trait being able to disable uh, enemy towers, allowing for very quick pushing Diablo. Generally, Diablo is chosen a little bit later in the lineup or early as a deliberate pairing of some sort. Diablo doesn't have the clear pair yet. And oh, no. Uh, no pairing. Taronda. No, Taronda belongs with Diablo. They're meant <laughs> to be together. Uh, of course, I think this is a very, very sharp counter pick from Indiana. Taronda yeah. and Vala continue to maintain the damage and denying the Taronda Diablo combo. Indiana snipes Taronda says thank you very much. And using Taronda can be very strong with Jaina being comboed in. The Hunter's Mark can really amplify the damage she already has, which is one of the abilities that she can perform. And then Vala, great follow up as well. And I remember Indiana, they seem to favor a lot of high damage heroes, and we might see them pick up a fourth one as well. Wow, Illidan. Now, th this is going to be a big opportunity for Indiana to pick up two solid tanks, in particular ETC. Yeah, probably e ETC and Malfurion seem to make the most sense to me now because uh, when you have that three fun fatals, the, the lethal ladies, Malfurion with his heroic healing, with his uh, uh, area of effect healing, he is the best to keep all three of them alive. So not surprised there. It was pretty much a no-brainer at this point. Now, Illinois, they have a ranged damage dealer, kind of in Sylvanas, they have an assassin what else? They could be adding anything here. Maybe even ah. a little grub war <gasps> called what? Abathur. Abathur. Now, of course, Abathur is a hero <laughs> that we need to spend a lot of time talking about, both here and into the match. Abathur is a unique hero in that he generally is not on the battlefield fighting. He stays in a safe spot, and all of his abilities 
are meant to be cast globally to support his yeah. allies. He's an ever-looming presence. He sits behind towers, but he's able to jump on allies and help them out with damage, with shielding, uh, of course, just trying to give them a little bit of sustain. And what he does also is he naturally pushes lanes as well. You know how we talked about catapults and the other maps and they'll push when you kill off a keep? He has his own little built-in catapult that will spawn from him every uh, 12 to 15 seconds. So getting him in a lane and absorbing experience and helping out teammates can be something that's very, very powerful. <laughs> now, you want to make sure when you get Abathur, though, on this battleground that you get an early lead. You don't want to fall yeah. behind his Abathur on such a small map. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, the thing that's so painful about Abathur is that if he's not played very, very well on a tight team fight focused map, you get nothing out of him. Yeah, he's not another body on the field, but he, he, he can bond with any of his heroes to add extra power. Well, on the left side, you have Indiana University. On the far right, you have Illinois, Urbana as well. But let's go ahead and check out the minimap. For Abathur, what's really important for him on this battleground in particular is he should always try to be on the opposite side of the team. So if, for example, in the top left corner, you have the entire blue team pushing, he should be down here being the little warm that he is. That little uh, line there is warm. But nonetheless, he is uh, fantastic at counter pushing on the battleground. So we'll keep an eye out for him. And of course, he'll want to play around a lot of the objectives. So two minutes, Spider Queen. There is Abathur. He is actually currently in the very far top right, right right now, which is actually pretty darn standard, as you'll see a lot of pressure in the middle map. He wants to stay away from the fights as much as possible. Very curious to see how Abathur is going to play out as the game goes on. Generally, Abathur, like you said, he has that mini built-in catapult, which means he has to stay in a somewhat vulnerable position. Not a lot of hiding spots on Tomb of the Spider Queen. It's a very straightforward map. And Graves Robber tries to bait, and it looks oh. like Wrath bit. And he is oh. down immediately. I mean, the little bait. I love that from Graves Robber stepping forward saying, oh, I'm Taranda. I'm super flimsy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, Diablo gets taken down there. Now, uh, I like to point out that neither of the two main supports there, Malfurion and Uther, took Conjurer's Pursuit. This is a mana talent that allows them to stay on the map for a long time and be effective. Malfurion went for Scouting Drone, which is going to give vision of the gem paying stations. Uther went for Reach, which allows his Holy Light to cross a greater distance. He can be further away from the target that he wants to heal. Look for that one to potentially keep Illidan alive here. Very tricky series of fights are going to be coming up for Illinois. The fact that Sylvanas needs to be in aggressive positions, the fact that Illidan needs support, and I think most importantly, the fact that no one really knows what Abathur is going to do at this point in time. Sadaharu as Sylvanas not getting to do very much in the mid lane as there is the try push. Mr. Burks carefully sitting behind the wall, just hanging out again. Mr. Burks' abilities are global, so you'll often see extra little bonuses appear above the heads of his allies. Now I'd like to point out that Abathur playstyle, with having an Abathur Having, having an Abathur on your team requires for a completely different playstyle. You don't have two bodies to roam around and ping pong between the different lanes. Abathur can make even odds in your favor. It doesn't always have the value of a full hero. For instance, you have a 1v1, Abathur symbiotes with the allied hero. It's now what I call maybe a 1.5 versus 1, 1.75 versus 1. He will tilt any small skirmish in the allied favor. And that is exactly how you play with an Abathur on your team. You want to have a lot of different skirmishes oh, wow. rather than full-blown 5v5s very early on. I do want to mention that Illinois is doing a good job of getting turn-ins on their gems already. They're still actually tied with the uh, blue team 20 to 17 because naturally Indiana University has an advantage. They have more bodies on the field, which means they have the ability to kind of muscle their way in to get turn-ins. Oh, but Dan is in trouble. There goes a uh, Toronto Stun. It does miss the Luna Flare, and you see him turn around because Wrath is showing up. And you see Abathur right now on top of Dan. He's actually very, very a, a strong target for Mr. Berkey to jump onto. We'll see that pretty often throughout the game. Thayun's continuing to try to turn in. Wrath, zoning out the enemies. And by zoning, a very common term you'll hear throughout the cast, the idea of just pushing someone out of a particular area. Sort of, I almost think of it like sheepdogs. Just gently pushing on all sides, saying, no, 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 you guys are going to stay here. You don't get to be here. Yeah. All right, experience very, very equal here. Both 5.2, Sadaharu taking some damage, but already set up his haunting wave escape and teleported onto his Banshee's nice escape there. Four blue team heroes at the top there. As now they'll be starting to pay a few more gems, and since the red team knows they're going to reclaim the middle space soon, they're actually pulling towards the bottom. Here's one of the cute tricks that you can do with an Abathur. You see Dan actually went down there to the mercenary camp and grabbed that. And normally Oda can do it all right, but with the added damage, the shields that are provided by Abathur, you're able to grab it really quickly. So they actually snuck 
mercenary camps in an, an early state that you normally don't see. You don't see this until about five to seven minutes. And now we have Giants pushing in the bottom left corner, which opens up more avenues for them to turn up in the middle lane as three people came down here in the bottom to help defend that. Yeah, and see what that gains them. That means that Illidan now on Dayun, he can start to try and pay off here. Frostball targeted at the wrong... Oh, no, oh, the missed. blizzard missed. 21 gems are paid there. Now, this isn't a huge deal, but that was a little bit inaccurate there by Kaze as uh, those 21 gems were paid off. Game is super even, and normally you're going to see an after um, with the team kind of fall behind a little bit, but now finally the blue team was able to secure a couple more turn-ins of gems in that bottom turn-in point, and now the red team is forced to pull back and defend. And you see them as a team. Nice choice here. They run straight to the mercenary camps and grab them. So Makes absolute sense. Just trying to maintain some sort of response to the pressure because there's really the one-two punch. There's first, can we deal with this initial shove? And then after that's done, there's going to be an immediate turn in from Illinois. And I love this play from Indiana, ensuring that they get the extra oomph by taking their bruiser camp as well. <laughs> yeah, both of the bruisers will be clashing there in the middle, even as the web weavers are descending once again down on every lane. Now, five blue team heroes, mighty churros, banding up together here in the middle. This is an unorthodox strategy. Normally you have one member in one lane, one in the bottom, and three in the middle. For the early game, um, uh, spider queens that are pushing because they don't really do that much damage, but when you put all five heroes in one lane, it actually does do a lot of damage, and it works because the opposing team has Abathur. Yeah, it kind of guarantees you to get a, f well, not guarantee, but oftentimes you get a fork out of it, but you may lose some experience. They're doing a nice job, though, of, uh, yeah, indeed, banding together because the enemy team have an Abathur. They're getting towers in the middle and in the top. At the bottom lane, Web Weavers are already taken down, so that's the end of the Web Weaver phase, at least. Well, it looks like Illinois is going to try to step up, see if they can make some magic happen. But no, the fact that Indiana is roaming solidly as five, shutting down any attempts from Illinois to isolate a single one. And again, this is the one-two punch. There was a defense, and immediately there's going to be the counter swing from Illinois. And I'm curious, Tim, how is Abathur going to factor in to the pushing for Illinois? Well, it's going to be helpful right here. Oh. He jumps on Dayan, and Dan, with the help of Wrath and Sadaharu, are able to focus down a member. This now puts the opposing team in a 5v4, because remember, even though Abathur's body isn't here, he can always jump on his teammates. Now, the pushing is really helpful here from Abathur, as you mentioned earlier, as Abathur will be able to jump into a different lane and help with that small little um, uh, catapult that we mentioned earlier, the, the locust that he has. So the entire team is pushing up here in the top lane, and we actually have Abathur in the very far bottom right, and Ball is actually having to defend against that. So Abathur will try to help out, and this actually puts the uh, red team here in a four-on-four -four position with the possibility of Abathur Symbiote jumping onto a teammate. Right now we're seeing Illinois pushing in hard, but Indiana, when they all group together, they managed to kill off three front lines in total. This is the first one going down. Illinois is going to attempt to rotate down to the, one of the southern lanes, but they have to do it quickly. It already looks like Vala in the far south was able to eliminate the Web Weaver there, so there's not going to be as much damage dealt. But keep in mind, Sylvanas is with part of Illinois, so they're able to just turn off the shots on the forts. Now, Illinois is about 20% away from getting level 10, and there's 40% away by Indiana. So ideally, Illinois would like to have a fight in the next five seconds or so. Or they can just say, no, 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 it's getting too close. They're both pretty much reaching level 10 at the same time. They're getting the Siege Giants here. Now, Illinois has barely any poke damage. The only range damage they have, in fact, is Abathur's stabs as well as Sylvanas' arrows. But for the most part, when the enemy is staying behind the gate, they can't really poke a lot of damage. So what they want is a really hard engage here. And for Indiana, they need to watch out for exactly that. Well, it looks like Indiana is rotating around to the south side. I think that was a very sharp decision by Illinois to say, well, you know what? None of us are really quite going to be able to deal with the big push yet. Let's go ahead and apply pressure there and then try to deny Indiana University the turn-ins. It's 43 out of 55 versus nothing yet turned in for Illinois. But again, the combo pressure is opening up the opportunity for them to do so. In the south side, again, we see this posturing where both teams have almost their entire compositions just barely dancing outside of vision range of one another, looking for any opportunity. Now, this is uh, this is getting pretty tense. I mean, we're actually at 8 minutes 30 and only one takedown apiece. I feel like this is the calm before the storm. 
as neither have really tipped their hand yet and committed heavily to a fight. I do 53. want... 53... Oh, yeah? Oh, I just want to mention really quickly here, Indiana, or, or Illinois, has actually put a couple of creature murders down. That is from, actually, Abathur. And if they can get some bait to happen in that area when they're going for a turn-in, they can actually poison someone down really quickly because that does do a decent amount of burst damage. So you see those setups everywhere here. You see it all over the map. They're going to try and get a fight to happen if possible. And of course, a any outcome to the fight, you know Indiana, uh, Indiana University is going to be as quickly as they can darting straight to the middle. I think this is very smart, very cautious from Illinois. But I got to ask you, Tim, do you think that Illinois is being too cautious here? No, they're playing actually pretty solid just because Indiana is playing super cautious and staying near forts, turrets. Those are things that you don't want to dive into uh, unless you have the upper hand. And really, they don't have the upper hand until they have their web weavers get here. Now, Wrath does get caught by a Lunar Flare. Mr. Berkey's is going in. Avatar should be jumping in pretty soon as well as Avatar did use his heroic ultimate evolution to clone an actual Illidan here. So Deanne over here on the right side is actually the real wow. heroic. Mr. Berkey wow. is getting a pick up. Grave Robbers in trouble. And these heroes are very low in HP. Is Diane going to keep chasing? Gosh, the double Illidan did absolutely massive damage. And as we see, it's 5v4. The Illidan you saw fall, that was a fake Illidan. All five of Illinois are alive. And I mean, the cloning from Abathur is massive. And all of a sudden, Abathur is going to be able to push these lanes a little more strongly. We see Web Weavers doing great work at the far southern lane. Yeah, there was two takedowns there for Team Illinois as the wonderful Lightning Breath with the Metamorphosis follow-up managed to clinch those two kills there. We were also in a situation where Blue Team only has four forts left, one fort and three keeps, and all six are still up for Illinois. Yeah, just pulling up the mini-map here, you can see all six uh, forts and keeps are currently up for them. They're feeling great in terms of infrastructure as they have all seven available to them. They are looking fantastic at this point. And right now, the Mighty Heroes are slowly, if you will, losing the game with a constant pressure coming from Amateur. They have to make some plays pretty soon here. The problem is, is that Illinois is constantly moving correctly, doing a good job of really trying to prevent themselves from being in a place where Indiana can capitalize. But as we move to the late game, we do have Indiana unlocking those talents, those heroics, those uh, storm powers that eventually get them to a point where they can go for the engagement. You're looking at Electra right now. He needs to be the one that actually goes in and starts a fight. And of course, 51 out of 55 gems turned in for Indiana University. After this outcome, they just need some way to step into one of the turn-in pods, drop off just a few to begin swinging the momentum back. But of course, Mr. Burks, that's Abathur cloning Illidan. So right now there is double Illidan, Skilladin on the field, Dayun in the far back, staying out of range. Mr. Burke diving to the other side again. That is a clone. If it dies, it is not a key kill. Abathur still stays up. And this is so exceptional. It's 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 like aggressive caution. They're gonna walk forward, they're gonna lose an Abathur ultimate, but they're going to pick down a tower. They're gonna pick down the maybe both towers and the wall. They're trading, and if you're asking me, they're trading up. They're getting infrastructure, they're getting map pressure, they're keeping up with it constantly. So yeah, I agree with you completely. But finally, Indiana's gonna try and make a play here. They're gonna walk in because that ultimate evolution is oh, down for no. Abathur. Morshpit missing everything there in the ETC, and he should be protecting his backline, who are now getting torn apart by Lightning Breath and Illidan. Tyrande down, Jaina down. Now Furion being focused, Wilted goes down as well, as this is a massive landslide victory there for Illinois. A devastating 180 at 51 of 55 gems still and just like you say, Grubby, this was not a cleanly planned fight from Illinois. This was seeing, recognizing a single misstep from ETC, darting right by, punishing the extremely weak back line. Taronda, Jaina, Vala, made of paper. The top boss is now free to take. And I, I've said this probably four times as broadcast because it's my favorite thing in the world. The boss is typically where you go to throw games because, as you see, quite the time investment. But right now, this was the perfect play for Illinois to capitalize on this situation. Yep. Abathur's confused why everyone is so hurt. He feels so safe <laughs> next to his fort there. All right, so the Grave Golem, the boss has been captured and will be pushing at the top lane. This is a lot of pressure for Indiana to deal with. And right now, Illinois just taking full advantage of it, turning in all of their gems. 40 out of 60 already available for them. And checking out the mini-map, they also could grab these giants down here in the bottom right corner. Uh, they could really just grab those if they would like to. And you're going to see them constantly moving around the map. Illidan's actually heading down to the area. This entire time, Indiana is stuck here. They have to defend against this golem. Illinois has been probably the most active of any team we've seen in the Epic Eight of assaulting the mercenary camps regularly. They've taken their bruisers, I believe, three times this game. This is the second siege giant at the south end. And it looks like they're just going to join in and push. 
the Abathur ultimate is up. They can, Mr. Burks can clone Illidan, and they can do the same play we've seen them do throughout this game. Now we have 10 seconds away from Mighty Churros there. They have 10 seconds away on one of their heroics there, so they need to buy a little bit of time. They will be granted exactly that. They're behind the wall, but key point here is Illinois at level 16 versus 14. They're set up here. Wrath trying to bait them out. Kakisho hiding there, revealing himself now, realizing the gig is up. And, well, Web Weavers have been spawned for the blue team. They actually managed to uh, pay up somewhere. I think Mount Fearing was able to sneak up at that top yeah. one, and now the Web Weavers yeah. coming in. The question is, day nine, can they do anything with it? Well, the <laughs> this is one of the most unfortunate Weaver spawns possible. <laughs> it spawns right in front of the team on the wrong side of the map. It's going to fall very quickly. Same story up at the top side. But the important thing is what Indiana's really looking for is less a massive win and more, at the very least, just a chance to get to the midline. And I don't even think Illinois is going to let them do that. We see Wilted at the top side. Malfurion taking massive damage. That Starfall is in perfect position. Kakisha is going to go down. What a Starfall from Graves Robber. And now it's four on five. The advantage goes to Indiana. This is what they've been looking for. Wrath, Diablo, great at engaging. Not so great at trying to evade. Dayun with the buff from Abathur, the symbiote floating above head. Is it going to be enough? Dayun's actually decided to turn. Electra. Electra a little bit too far forward, and suddenly ETC's down. That means Fala, Jaina, Taronda, the weakest heroes on the team. What a turnaround from Illinois. And Wrath will take down Malfurion there. Wilted going down. Case, the only one left to tell the story of how their epic campaign and initial success ended up in disaster and peril. Illinois was at level 16, by the way, during that entire engagement. They just had just a small amount of, uh, of a lead, and that lead, you saw them turn around, even at a disadvantage in numbers, and secure a couple of takedowns with the help of Abathur, and of course, take that fight. So nicely done by them. Indiana still behind. They're about to hit level 16, but when you're all not available to be on the battleground, that doesn't really help you in any way, yeah. shape, or form. Well, that started out as one of the best fights that Indiana University has had up to this point. They got a takedown and they chased. But once again, that 180 with just three heroes with that symbiote support there managed to take down the opponents. And I feel like once again, maybe the Electra on the ETC was a little bit too far forward. If he can curb his enthusiasm a little bit and kind of stay among his ranged damage dealers, he can make sure that they come to their fruition, that they do the damage that they need to do and that they have the protection that they so desperately require. Yeah, I mean, I think that that's an interesting notion about the functionality of the tank. A lot of times you want to be the hard engager, you want to be getting in there. Other circumstances, you actually want to be playing quite passively and carefully and just constantly looking over your shoulder as, you know, are, are my assassins safe? Are they safe? Are you good? Okay, yeah. I'm going to stay close to you. Don't worry, I'm close to you. But I mean, the ETC, like you said, just being a little bit too far forward and we're back to square one, Indiana going, gosh, how can we advance forward? Illinois is roaming beautifully as a team. Level 16 for both, two levels away for Storm Talents. Delectra trying to dart in the mosh pit, immediately canceled by the overpower, and suddenly Mr. Burks decides Diabolo's a good suit to wear today. Doesn't manage to do very much to it. Very nice shutdown by Indiana. We see Delectra doing the full run around, exhausted, one lap to go, and then finally will be with the team. But at this point in time, it looks like the push from Illinois is withering. Now that's two. That's two heroics used each. The mosh pit failed, sure, but uh, ultimate evolution is gone as well for Abathur. And so they have three apiece. There's no talent advantage yet for Illinois. They don't have a tier of skills there or over their opponent. But what is happening is those web weavers taking down the top keep, now assaulting the middle one. It's now or never. Indiana needs to defend this one. They cannot afford to lose another keep this soon. Delectra jumping in. Lunar Flare on Wrath. Dayun trying to jump out there. And for now, it's a disengage. Just a little bit of poking damage uh, planted by Taronda, by Jaina, but not not anything that could be game ending. And Sylvan is oh. so excellent on this map where you can always guarantee that she'll be able to walk up and to shoot directly down on a turret. And at this point, the disengages from Illinois are great. 19 to 17 seconds from the heroic talents. Things yep. are not looking good here for Indiana University. They only have one lone keep available down there in the very far bottom left corner. That's the only infrastructure they have available to them. And at the same time, Illinois is grabbing this boss mercenary. If we look at the mini map, we can see that the blue team is starting to head on over, but they're pretty far away. If they're gonna be looking at this fight, they need to do it right away. 
And yep. now the boss. Oh. Did they go big. there to throw the What's game? The Starfall go annihilating the front line. Delectra trying to get to the front, but the Diablo breath instantly burns down. Uh, Taronda, Jaina has fallen. Mr. Burke is cloned Illidan again. The fight continues on. Everyone is so low on health. There goes down Kakisha, and we see Wrath still holding strong. Delectra, though, will be unable to evade. They had the perfect opportunity. The Starfall an inch too far south, and it's a surrender. It's good game. Indiana bows out. Had they done the exact same thing, Indiana, there, but just 10, no, even just four seconds earlier, it could have looked very differently here. But during all this, level 20 was reached, the Grave Golem was already captured, and Team Mad Banners, they call themselves, from Illinois Urbana Champagne, are pushing into the enemy core and going for the juggler. Clean, solid win from Illinois, grouping up after the early advantage to guarantee Sylvanas shutting down the turrets, continuing to advance aggressively. Nice <laughs> dance moves there, Abathur, who says, hey, remember me? I was part of this game. And I mean, I really got to say, Tim, Abathur played a vital role in that game and with the, the thing, clones. The thing is, is he's, a, he's a hero that if he's played well, he still barely knows that he's doing a lot, but he was pushing <laughs> in a different lane so yeah. much. A lot of the action is the Illidan, you know, jumping around, doing a lot of the damage, mm -hmm. really causing a lot of disruption, while Abathur is just on the other side of the map where you're not available to defend and really just doing a lot of work. So Abathur, again, with the uh, sieging and the pushing, slowly whittled down their opponents on all fronts. And the way to fight that is, as a team, your team, uh, the blue team, needed to just go ahead and push, start some fights, yeah. start making plays. You can't wait it out. If you wait it out, Abathur wins every time. Yeah, exactly. You don't want to get to level 16 and say, hey, I, we didn't really make anything happen yet because yeah. those locusts that Abathur is spawning periodically, they're going to keep pushing in. He's got that right, global right. presence. It is five fingers into a fist that is the most powerful counter to Abathur, and they maybe just didn't do enough of that. Yeah, I mean, do you think that the response should have been more to group up and to push back? Because it seemed that every single time they were able to group up as a team, stand by the turrets, it was relatively defensive on the other side. Yeah, I mean, it is scary facing Illidan, Uther, Abathur, Sylvanas there, that combination that they had in Diablo, but I mean, you can't be scared in these games. You're committed already. You're playing <laughs> in the Epic Eight, and it's do or die. So I do want to show you yeah. guys a pretty crazy replay here. On the blue team, yeah. it's on the burden of them to get a solid engagement because they have a lot of Squish characters. They had Taronda, they had Jaina, they had Vala, heroes that get taken down pretty quickly. So it's all on Delectra, the ETC player, to get a solid engagement. The problem? There's Sylvanas, she has silencing arrow. She negates a majority of his engaging tools. Um, so we're gonna see this here as uh, he's actually gonna go for an engagement and he actually, I believe, misses the mosh pit. There's a silencing arrow that follows up in that moment and it happens, Illidan goes crazy. He dives in. Uh, it's gonna be Diane down here in the bottom right corner. So let's go ahead and watch this fight. We're gonna pause it right when we see the full engagement. But Delectra is the important one. He goes for the engagement, he starts the mosh pit, but it misses. It's nowhere near this entire team fight in any way, shape or form. At that point, the red team, all four of these members here, let's go ahead and show some awesome numbers. One, two, three, four. All four of these guys can just straight up ignore Delectra. He does nothing anymore because he's wasted his heroic and his engagement tools. All they have to do is focus down this small area of members, and you'll see the entire team for the red team, Illinois, just charge in and make the plays. Let's go ahead and hit a play here, Jake, as we're going to see. Metamorphosis goes down. It hits three members. We see Dayon just cleaning up with the help of his teammates, and, of course, Abathur. Four members down, a clean slate, and you see... That really set the tempo for the rest of the game. They won an amazing fight. They were able to really just take that advantage, move forward, grab golems, grab mercenary camps, turn in gems, and really just the tempo was set. And you just saw the blue team feeling deflated after that. Illinois leads now 1-0 to zero after an excellent performance, and especially the cunning use of Abathur. Will they be using more cute team compositions coming up? I'm excited to see. Illinois versus Indiana at Heroes of the Dorm continues after this.